A little over a month ago, without any premonition that it would be successful, I devoted an episode of Metal Mythos to a band that are every bit as obscure as they are influential. The almighty Alcatraz, the band widely credited with launching the careers of Ingve Malmsteen and Steve Vai. And then two messages hit my inbox simultaneously. Having viewed the video in question, one came from the man who not only founded the AOR melodic rock pioneers New England, whose hit song Don't Ever Wanna Lose You" remains in heavy rotation on classic rock radio stations some 30 years later, but of course the co-founder of Alcatraz, Gary Shea, and the other was the legend himself, the only man who successfully replaced the late great Ronnie James Dio, Graham Bonnet. He was interested in collaborating on a mythos-related project that I'm still working on at present, but in the meantime, to my delight, we both rapidly discovered that this unnamed project would actually necessitate the recording of one of the more in-depth interviews of the man's career. So what follows for your listening or viewing pleasure, Rageaholics, is the unabridged, hour-length interview with a man myself and many other metalheads consider a living icon. Buckle the fuck in for some bonnets. <laughs> Joining me today on Mythos Aftershock is a rock icon with a set of titanium pipes, not to mention exceptional taste in eyewear. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> the man who replaced Ronnie James Dio, head warden of Alcatraz, brigadier general of the Graham Bonnet Band, heavy metal's answer to James Dean with a voice that could drive a hurricane back into the sea. Graham Bonnet, I cannot thank you enough for joining me today. Oh, you're very welcome, and it's great to be here. Now, I'm only going to touch on this briefly because, let's be honest, number one, everyone and their peg-legged uncle asks you about goddamn Rainbow. Yeah. I'm sure you've had it You've had it up to two feet above your head with talking about it. Yes, yeah, I'm drowning. <laughs> number two, this interview is primarily going to be like a companion piece to my video about Alcatraz, so we're going to at least attempt to constrain ourselves to your later career. Okay. So, uh, first things first, obviously just going to touch on it. I have to hear the definitive... Uh, version of this audition story because when i was making my alcatraz video yeah i tried to find the ultimate recitation of this and couldn't locate it uh because after a hit song with the marvels and a brief solo career you get a call from richie to replace yeah. dio and rainbow mm -hmm. and, and do feel free to correct me on any particulars but you audition at least initially without the benefit of a microphone yeah that's right <laughs> this is true uh would you want me to elaborate on that yeah, how did how did this happen? You show up and basically what you were warming up or? Yeah, well, what what happened was I knew nothing about Rainbow, so I had to learn some tunes from uh, their best, you know, past uh, catalog. So I went out, bought some albums, and I was told to learn a song called Mistreated, which I didn't know because I didn't know anything about Rainbow whatsoever. And I learned this one song. Yeah, unfortunately, yeah, I wasn't into that kind of stuff by then. I was um, very much into something completely different. But we'll talk about that. Anyway, it, um, I learned the piece. I went out to, um, it was a little place on the border of Switzerland and France, this shadow. And um, I went into this big old room. This was huge with a drum kit set up and a, a veranda, very grand looking, sort of like a, a big dining room, I guess you'd call it, in this semi-castle type place. And I thought, well, if I screw up and I'm on microphone, they're going to laugh at me if I don't really do this song very well. So what I did, because the, the room was so large and it had great <laughs> acoustics, what I did was just sing off microphone. And, uh, you know, we sang it through once and uh, they all were smiling and laughing. And I thought, oh, OK, what are they laughing at? <laughs> And uh, then I did it again off microphone, and then Don Airy said to me, that's fucking great, man, but this time do it on microphone. We want to hear every syllable. So after all the girlfriends came into the room, they, they all had their girlfriends, wives, and whatever at, at the building, um, all staying there because they'd been there, they were going to be there for months or whatever, in, in theory. Anyway, it didn't end up that way, but we weren't there as long as we thought we'd be. The, the girlfriends all came in, were standing on top of this, uh, on this balcony overlooking where the rehearsal was taking place, just over the drum kit kind of thing. They were peering down, and they're all smiling away and pointing, go, this is the guy. And uh, 
well, well, I sang it on microphone and they said, well, do you want the job? And I, I said, well, I'll have to think about it because it really wasn't my kind of music. I was into a completely different sort of R&B pop kind of thing, which I was doing on, on my own. Well, yeah, and your and your early your early solo stuff very diverse. Uh, you you were doing you know a little bit of doo wop here and there. Yeah. You were doing you covered a Bob Dylan yeah. tune. And this was putting me in, into one pocket, so to speak. So, you know, all the stuff they played me, they played me stuff later on. And I thought, well, where the hell do the vocals come in and that kind of thing? Because it meant nothing to me. It was a, a roadmap with no direction, you know? So obviously uh, at the time, a lot was made of your unconventional look for a metal front man. So I, I have to ask, Graham, you're rocking the pompadour in the 70s. Yeah. It's, tw- it's 2015, and 40 years later, everyone wants to look like Graham Bonnet. Oh, we're talking like celebrities here. We're talking like Jimmy Fallon's rocking the pompadour. Oh, I know. Car- I know. Yeah, it was, a, it was a whole thing. Yeah. Oh, oh, you're talking about now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm talking about now. Yeah, yeah. I mean, everybody's realized that uh, it's the most comfortable hairstyle to wear. And it sort of is never um, sort of dated because it comes and goes. I just kept it the same all these years. And so, um, you know, when I look back at old photographs, I'm I'm not wearing silly clothes, you know, spandex and stuff like that. It's usually a white T-shirt and jeans or a plain or a suit. Um, I did have the Hawaiian shirt once in a while, which is a bit silly, but it was... You know, you can still wear that stuff now, and it doesn't uh, look dated. That's that's a thing that a photographer told me, a guy called Terry O'Neill, when I had some photos taken way back in the 70s. And he said to me, don't bring in a load of costumes. You know, don't don't bring in costume changes. I went, walk, I walked in there with a Levi jacket, white T-shirt, and a pair of jeans. He said, that's it. That's all you need. He said, I might just need you to take the T-shirt off once. And that was it. And I learned from him uh, that it isn't the clothes that make the man, it's the man that makes the man. Exactly. Yeah. So basically you're from the future is what you're saying. Is exactly. What you're saying. <laughs> this is right. <laughs> now, okay, before we move on from Rainbow, um, obviously just this past week, actually, some fairly big news came down. It is now confirmed that this time next year, Richie Blackmore will be returning to rock and heavy metal. Yeah. Uh, so before we move on from Rainbow, I would be remiss to not ask you your thoughts on this development. <laughs> Well, this, this is something that's sort of, I, I don't know if it's kind of uh, fact or fiction, you know, because I know what uh, Rich is like, he's a, a great practical joker, and it wouldn't surprise me if he just said this on a whim, you know, he's probably in the bar somewhere having, having a beer, and probably say, oh yeah, I'm going to get rain, I'm going back to rock and roll again, but I think, if I think he was going to get a band back together, I think he would put the original Deep Purple lineup back together, Th- that's what I would imagine, rather than Rainbow, but... I don't know because sometimes he's uh, hard to read, you know. He's he's a funny guy and a very private guy and a very shy guy. But if he comes up with a funny idea, he'll run with it. And I'm just thinking that maybe the Rainbow so-called, you know, reincarnation or reformation of Rainbow would be a little harder than putting together um, uh, the old uh, Deep Purple lineup because uh, the original Rainbow guy is not with us. And if anybody was going to put Rainbow back together with Richard Blackmore playing, it should be Ronnie Dio singing. The rumor at the time was, of course, that Joe Lynn Turner would be the vocalist uh, working on this. But now, apparently, he's clarified and said he wants to work with a wide array of vocalists. Yeah. So, yes. uh, so obviously, I, I suppose that answers my question. There have been no overtures from him toward you or, or vice versa to, to work on this? Yeah. I, I don't know what's going to happen. You know, I, I wouldn't be surprised if nothing happened, but if uh, Richie called me up, I would certainly like to do a show or two with those guys again because it was uh, probably one of the best times of my life, to be honest. And cool. he gave me a new career. So moving on to Alcatraz, um, prior to their involvement in the establishment of Alcatraz, the other two founding members, uh, Gary Shea and Jimmy Waldo, were originally in a successful 70s AOR band called New England. Um, How exactly did the three of you make contact and basically decide to form the band? Well, we were looking for – we were trying to put a so-called kind of super group together, (laughs) if possible. We were looking for players who were known, who had hit records and people – you know, names that people would recognize – so my manager yeah. was looking through, I don't know, a music magazine, and he found out that these guys from New England were looking for work. They, the, New England had uh, disbanded, and we'd already advertised that we needed a um, keyboard player and a bass player. That's the first uh, you know, per, a part of the personnel we looked for. And these two guys were you know, close friends, 
And so they came along to meet us one day at a, you know, at a restaurant and we talked to them and said, okay, these are the guys. And the, you know, they play pretty well. I didn't know anything about their music, but they played pretty well when we played together in my garage in Calabasas here. And, uh, so we said, okay, let's take it from here. Now we need to get a drummer and a guitar player. But Jimmy and uh, Jimmy and Gary worked together for a long time, so they were a pretty good team together, you know? Now, when I opened up the Alcatraz episode of uh, mm. Mythos, I did so under the premise, essentially, that Alcatraz is sort of one of the 80s metal bands that has unfortunately been forgotten by a lot of people. Yeah. Um, and to my mind, perhaps you'll feel differently, uh, one of the chief reasons for that appeared, to my eyes anyways, uh, as a layman on the outside, to be some mismanagement. Yeah. Um, start, starting almost from the very beginning with a somewhat infamous figure by the name of Andy Truman. How did he become involved with the band exactly? Well, he he was a friend of a friend, and he used to manage uh, people like uh, the Bay City Rollers, believe it or not. Yeah. And also, he managed, um, uh, oh God, what's his name? Um uh, the guy that died recently always wore a suit. Um, uh, you know, uh, Robert, Palmer? Robert Palmer. Yes, I'm going to think of his name. Okay, there we are. Yeah, Robert, he managed Robert Palmer, Jethro Tull, and also the Bay City Rollers. So he had a pretty good sort of mixed background, very very strange combination of people there. But yeah. uh, he was, um, I was advised by some of my friends that this guy would be perfect because he's such a go-getter. And he sh sure was. You know, he was really, as soon as the day I met him, he said, okay, where do we start? Now start singing. I've got a cassette machine here. What do you got? You got any songs? And Andy was right on it from the beginning. So um, he was out there looking for um, guitar players and drummers like I was. He said, we've got to find people with a name. And then uh, it would bring interest into the band. So, yeah, he was a pushy guy. Yeah, okay. So, so it's a because there's a lot of myths that surround this guy. I mean, he had managed like a circus or something, and they couldn't get work. Well, Andy. It. Yeah, some some wild stories about Andy Truman. Uh, as oh well. yeah, yeah. I mean, some of the stories I don't even know. Oh, he also managed Vixen at one point as well. Those guys, those girls. Yeah. I mean, he was all over the place. If he could get his foot in the door in any kind of sort of showbiz thingy, he would be there. A circus sounds. That sounds pretty much like him, yeah, Barnum and Bailey's or something. But he's um, he was one of those guys that, even though he was a bit insane, he got things done. He was incredibly together in that way. So it's around this point in 82 that you're auditioning musicians for the vacant uh, drummer and guitar spots. Mm. Um, one of the things I very much regretted failing to mention in my episode was uh, among the drummers that you were auditioning was, of course, from Iron Maiden, uh, Clive Burr. How yeah. did he come to be involved, and how early on was he? Was it decided that he wasn't the guy? Because there are kind of conflicting reports on the internet. Oh, he was in the band for a minute, and then Ingve demanded he be fired, mm -hmm. and all these rumors, you know. So, what what exactly happened with auditioning drummers there? He, I mean, nobody was in the band. All we were doing were uh, just auditioning people, and he was one of the people we auditioned. You know, there's Ainsley Dunbar. There's ton, tons of people we auditioned for this band to make it right. And uh, he was just one guy that came over for a day and was at gone. Then we had another guy come in. A lot, a lot of the drummers uh, were there at um, auditions, and I wasn't even there. I couldn't tell you how many drummers we auditioned. <laughs> but eventually it got around to, we found out from a friend of ours that uh, this guy had left uh, Alice Cooper's band. And um, a couple of the guys in the band knew of uh, Januvina. And, uh, but, you know... Um, Clive was was there and gone. He, he wasn't fired. He just wasn't hired. Yeah. So it was it was essentially only ever at the uh, audition stage. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um. Which of course brings us at last to Ingve Malmsteen. So how yeah. did you go about essentially introducing the world to one of the preeminent guitar heroes of the past thirty years exactly? Yeah. Well, that that was, again was a pure fluke actually because uh, we knew everybody knew that we were looking around in Los Angeles for a guitar player. And I was thinking, well, we've got the kind of the rainbow lineup with the keyboards, etc. We wanted the same kind of combination of instruments and players. And what happened was this Gary Shea, I think it was, went into a store somewhere, and um, the, the guy behind the counter said, um, I, I know who you're looking for, because he'd heard that I was looking for someone who played like Richie Blackmore, and he said, I've got the guy, because he's a, a, a Richie freak, plays like him, dresses like him, etc., etc., except he's Swedish. So, um, okay, so he's not English, but he doesn't matter, he's not British. So um, I said, okay, well, I've got a song 
uh, that I would like this guy to learn. It was a song called SOS that uh, Russ Ballard wrote. And this friend of Ingve sent him the tape to listen to. And Ingve came along to the audition and played this song called SOS. And he just fit the bill straight away. As soon as he walked into the room, he was, I thought it was Richie Blymore, but with uh, blonder hair, you know. <laughs> And, uh, yeah. and much younger. I mean, he was like 19 years old or whatever he was at the time. And he was just perfect. And then we just started jamming out. And I said, bloody hell, this, this is the guy. He's just amazing. And he knew everything of Richie's stuff. He started doing Richie's guitar solos while we were just sitting around doing nothing. And it, it was just the guy. And it was just very, very obvious. Yeah. So going to be straight up about this, even at that nascent stage on a scale from one to Charlie Sheen on blow. How big was Ingve Malmsteen's ego? At first, he was he was the sweetest guy you could ever imagine. Uh, but as soon as we got stepped on stage and pe he could see people were watching every little finger movement, so to speak, watched everything he was doing. Um, he became the star because uh, physically, you know, you can see what a guitar player is playing. Vocally, you hear what they're doing. You can't see what happens inside their body physically. You know, it's it's probably harder work to sing than actually play a guitar. But anyway, it's a show, a showy thing. He, you know, was up and down the fingerboard and playing very fast, but very well and really cool licks. And he was taller than me. He kind of overtowered me. And he, in fact, he became sort of, uh, he, he got in the way to be honest with you, on stage eventually. But he had, you could see from the beginning that he had um, in his mind, you know, a, a career that was going to go probably out there on his own, you know. And that's what eventually what happened. And I know that my manager was seeing that also. And uh, a lot of people saying, why are you with this band? You need to be with a better band or you could do form your own band and start something else, you know, uh, instrumentally. So I understand during the demo process for No Parole from Rock and Roll, you and Ingve were briefly living under the same roof. How how did that work out? Because every time I think of it, it's a sitcom premise. Well, yeah, well no, no, we didn't love, live under the same roof. All love under the same roof comes to that. <laughs> it, he was living in um, another part of L.A. We got a nice apartment for him in a very um, Laguna Beach, in a very nice part of um, the county. Uh -huh. And he was living there for a couple of months and he wrecked the place. Um, you know, he's sticking up his amps up against the wall and leaning them back. You know, this is a Marshall stack. So he lived on his own because I don't think anybody could have hung around him, not even his old band members. Nobody was really friendly with him. And I didn't know why until much later, until we started playing live. And I realized this guy had an ego bigger than the four of us, the other four guys. It was just um, overwhelming when he became basically the star of the band and everybody was saying to him you know you can do this without these guys yeah and, and that's what happened so uh, but i never lived under the same roof now oh okay so okay gotcha when, when it came time to actually cut the record you were working with dennis mckay who i i talked about in one of my other episodes on judas priest he did the masterpiece stained class did you feel like he was a good fit for the first record because at, at first glance that would seem to be slightly different styles yeah yeah but it, yeah because of his reputation he seemed exactly the right guy again andy truman was looking for someone who'd had you know experience with the sort of same ish kind of music that we were doing and he was looking for the best or near enough the damn best and uh, he was perfect for that first album which i think was kind of like a rehearsal for the next album to me anyway yeah. the first album was an experiment i didn't think it would go anywhere i didn't think it was that good i thought everybody played good etc etc but i want i wasn't sure that the songs were that great and um whether the overall production and everything was as that good anyway <laughs> but uh, it was a, a pleasant surprise when suddenly i was totally wrong and i always think i'm right but I always look on the dark side, you know, it's kind of a, a thing. I always think of the, with the bad things that can happen. I never saw this band becoming anything but a band that was trying to copy Rainbow. And I thought that's where it would take a dive because people say, well, it's not as good as Rainbow, is it? You know, but it wasn't that way. It turned out to be a really, really good move to, for me to put this band together. So I, I have to touch on something I've personally always appreciated about your music. And it becomes immediately apparent in Alcatraz, the lyrics like even even skimming down the song mm. titles, too young to die, too drunk to live, General Hospital, God bless video. It's immediately clear these are not your traditional party all night, snorting, blow off hookers, bottoms, hail Satan. 80s metal lyrics was that a conscious effort on your part to sort of issue the traditional style of metal lyrics yeah absolutely because i couldn't that's why in the beginning i couldn't identify with rainbow because the lyrics 
were about, you know, Dungeons and Dragons and whips and chains. And I, I just thought that was funny. To me, that was kind of like Monty Python or later on um, Spinal Tap. I, I really thought it was the, the words were Siri, silly or Siri, as we say in, in, in Japan. <laughs> oh, sorry. I said Australia for a second. In the Asian past, I meant to say. But anyway, I, I couldn't identify with that. I had no idea what Ronnie was singing about. I had no idea what the songs were about, except they, they seemed to be fairy tales, but with this kind of heavy, evil thing going on and, you know, pictures of the devil and doing the devil's signs, etc. And I couldn't relate to it. And so I thought, well, I, I, like to have, I like to listen to songs that tell a story. Like the people I grew up with, the people I idolized were people like Paul McCartney and John Lennon you know, uh, Strawberry Fields and uh, Penny Lane and all those kind of songs which told a story. And you could relate to them. You could, you could paint, you know, you could paint that picture in your mind of this place, this time, these people. And that's what my songs really were all about, sort of reporting um, on whatever situation I may be in at the time or, you know, uh, thinking back situations that I've been in um, or places I've been. And like country songs, country songs sometimes have the greatest words and also, my, my another one of my favorite lyricists was is Chuck Berry. The the songs are all the same melody probably, but the lyrics are so poetic. And I was looking for a bit of both, telling a story but being poetic at the same time, and not explaining exactly what's going on. Let the the listener kind of sort out in his mind what this story is about, so that we listen over and over again and go, oh, I think I've got it now. You know. So I was you know dead against the so-called heavy rock, heavy metal lyric thing. <laughs> so um, as an aside, uh, as a massive Clint Eastwood fan, um, can you confirm or quash the rumor that the set used in the Island in the Sun video is actually from the movie mm -hmm. Escape from Alcatraz? Is that true? Yeah, yeah, it is. Awesome. It is, yeah. Yeah, it was a trip, that was. Because I thought that place w wasn't there anymore, you know. But we got we got there, and I'm, I'm going, shit, this is the fucking, the real thing. <laughs> and going up to the bars and realized they were made of, like, uh, wood. <laughs> <laughs> All this wood, wood, wood stuff. And then uh, sunlight coming through this one light, one window in the prison. And it's actually not, a, not the sunlight. It's actually a very, very bright arc lamp or something. Yeah. Uh, but it, it was so cool to be there. It was amazing, you know. And doing the drawing on the wall, and it's like, ooh. Mm. This was just, it was magical and the perfect setting. Uh, but of course, we had to have the chicks with the, uh, the garter belts and all that stuff, just to make it a little bit more spicy for the young, the young readers or the young viewers. <laughs> well, well because, because it was 1984, it had to be done. Yeah, it, you had to have them there. They have nothing to do with anything, but they had to be there for the, for the young guys, you know. That was MTV, you know. Yeah. Uh, so it wasn't long into the tour in 84 when the band start to rumble about replacing Ingve. But um, from, from what I understand, it was sort of a covert auditioning process because Ingve was technically still in the band at this point. Is it true that uh, the band, uh, when you actually did replace him, you had essentially done it before the tour was over and waited until it was over to sort of... Yeah, it, it was like, yeah, we had like three shows left and um, he, he'd been very, very uh, violent toward me and... Um, it was a, you know, the guys all said, look, this cannot happen. You just leave, you know, you can't try and beat up Graham or whatever because of certain things going on. He just became obnoxious and just so fucking full of himself. It was ridiculous. You couldn't play with this guy. He didn't want to share the stage with anyone. And so we said to our manager, Andy, that uh, Andy Truman, he's got to go. He said, no, you can't, you can't fire him. You can't fire him. I said, we have to. He's ruining um, what should be fun and, you know, a nice, you know, a great show and, and just destroying our, you know, enthusiasm for actually going out there and play. We didn't want to play with him anymore. He was just a damn nuisance, to put it mildly. And um, so what happened was we started to look around for other players before we got back home. And uh, on the just on the very last gig, we fired him and got on the bus and said, well, that's it. That's it anyway. And he didn't give a shit. You know, he says, oh, it's all right, man. I, I can do it on, on my own better. <laughs> and of course he did. He did very, very well without us and good for him, you know. Now, from what I've heard, even beyond Steve Vai, there were some fairly noteworthy guitarists auditioned at this point. Uh, yeah, Paul McCartney's uh, guy, he came and uh, played for us. Um, uh, Lawrence Juba and also... <laughs> Oh my God! I, I can't even I can't even remember who who who, who well, that's one name I can remember. But there were so many, 
And um, I think even Howie Simon, who I play with later, he, I think he came along and auditioned also. But it was a lot, a lot of people. And then um, we found out about uh, Jan Uvino, our uh, drummer. He knew um, um, of this guy called Steve Vai, who was with Frank Zappa's band. And he knew of him and got in touch with him. And so that's how Steve sort of came into the band, was through um, a Jan Uvino phone call and Steve coming along to see us. I think what people forget is that unlike Ingve, Steve Vai wasn't really like an unknown quantity at that point. He had been obviously, in, as you mentioned, in Zappa's band. Mm. And if I'm not mistaken, he even had a solo record out by that point. So grabbing him was actually a little bit of a coup. Was it just immediately apparent to you guys that he was the one? Well, it, it, it was him, really. I mean, he just said, I, I've got to be in this band. You know, he knew, um, I, we knew of his past, what he'd done. He'd been, with, you know, with a hugely successful band. He made um, that, uh, I think it was one album. What was it called? Um, Flexible. What? Flexible. Yeah, Flexible. That's right, yeah. And um, I heard his playing on there, you know, before I actually, you know, really auditioned with, I mean, played with him, I should say. And um, he had, anyone would have taken him, I think. You know, he could have gone to any band he wanted, but he really admired um, our band as such, and he wanted to be part of it. And uh, But he said, at the same time, he said, I'm fearful of following someone like Ingve Malmsteen because I, I don't play like him. I'm a completely different guitar player. But um, he fit really, really well. So is it at this point, um, Andy Truman, does he go, I believe he goes off with Ingve. Did you guys have to shake up your management at that point? Mm. Yeah, well, what happened then was um, with, with Andy was we, we had to give him money to go away because he wasn't going to go away. He said, no, I'm still going to manage the band. But he said, I want to go off with Ingve. Ingve. And, uh, well, he first said, first of all said, we've got to get Ingve back in the band. We said, no fucking way. No, not at all. Not at all. And he said, well, what are you going to do? He said, I want him back in the band. Said, and then we said to him, well, how about we fire you too? And so we fired our manager and he wanted money to go away. We gave him like 8,000 bucks and we got rid of him. And um, that was that. So we had no management for a while. Oh, you know. Okay. So it's at this point you're digging into Disturbing the Peace. For my money, mm -hmm. the most cohesive of the Alcatraz albums. It sounds more like more like a band instead of a band with Ingve noodling on top. Yeah. Um, as a member of the writing team, obviously, what's the creative thought process here? Because it's sort of radio friendly, but it's aggressive, but it's sort of prog metal at the same time. It's a little progressive at the same time, kind of out of left field when follow when it's following no parole from rock and roll is that a conscious effort yeah it was yeah i mean i wanted to get a, away from that style and uh, obviously with steve playing it, it was totally different and uh immediately I, I used to go to his studio and uh out here in uh, Sil a place called silma where he used to live and i would sit down th with him in front of the board and he'd just start playing a little bit so he had little bits of you know riffs or whatever and i i could immediately you know fi fix a melody into the parts he was playing because he said, no, no, you've got to sing here, you know, do it here. No, more singing. Oh, we'll have another bit here. Ah, and then it takes a left turn here. It doesn't go straight ahead. We do, we're going to a different time signature here, which I thought was great. You know, we're away from this, you know, 4-4, four, four, you know, everything, you know, 4-4 four, four or 24-24, whatever. It, it got away from that very obvious so-called heavy rock feel. It was inventive, and he's very inventive. And sort of, yes, progressive. I, I found it much more progressive than um, the thing we did before with, with Ingrid. That was, as I said, it was basically a rainbow copy band to me. That's why we, I, sh I wasn't sure it would work. But this was something uh, different that was very exciting for me because it gave me more space to write better um, lyrics and better melodies. Now, it's this album that produces arguably your most enduringly popular song, God Bless Video. Mm -hmm. uh, but from what I understand, upon its initial release, it was relatively ignored. What was that down to? Just lack of record company promotion? Or? Yeah, I, I think so, yeah. I mean, it was uh, <laughs> it was the beginning of the end, I think, you know. So we, we went out on tour. We did okay, but the record company at that point, the music business was changing, and they were looking toward... Um, I think at that time, yeah, it was just before Tina Turner's revival happened. They were they were think, they were focusing more on uh, on her stuff and building her career back up again at that time. And so people like Alcatraz were not their thing. We we were just we were lost. We were lost. 
And so uh, it came to an actual, you know, uh, the death of it. As soon as uh, as um, Steve was offered a job to join up with uh, David Lee Roth, that, that was kind of the end of it, we thought, you know. But it kind of fizzled on for a little while. Now, God Bless Video kind of revitalized you guys in the public consciousness by its inclusion in one of the best-selling video games of all time, uh, Grand, Theft, uh, Grand Theft Auto Vice City. Yeah, I know, yeah. Gamer or no, have you uh, witnessed this in its appropriate context, like in the game? Uh, yeah. <laughs> yes, I ha- yeah, my, in fact, my son had it, you know, and I, I'm going, well, we're on this? He says, yeah, Dad, this is... And it, some guy driving in the car or something and shooting people and blowing up or whatever the hell's going on. And there it is on the radio while this guy's driving along shooting people. And my son... Um, pointed it out to me and then it was sort of like a an accidental hit again you know or whatever if it was ever a hit in the first place but it, it became popular and so a lot of people know that song now which i, I thank the video game for very much but i'm, I'm really um in with their um the way they, the the violence of their video the games they're, they're just incredible you know but anyway it was a, a revitalized god bless video which is very nice yeah it got nice. uh, it got it sold something like 20 million copies i mean that's some pretty good exposure yeah yeah um, yes <laughs> didn't get much money out of that but uh <laughs> Anyway, there you go. No. <laughs> I remember share, sharing a bit with Steve, and he was like, is that it? Uh, <laughs> now, I've long wanted to answer uh, the answer to this question, because in 1985, you guys embark on a tour that, for whatever reason, does not end well. And we only ever hear sort of the severely truncated version of it was cut short due to sort of amorphous financial reasons. At this point, you've got a band, you've got a music video on MTV, you know, this should sort of be your big moment. What happens with this tour? Why does it end so unceremoniously? Well, because of the uh, Steve was offered a, a part in the movie, um, you know, Crossroads. Oh uh, yeah. And then after that was when uh, David Lee Roth came along and spotted this guy, you know, jumping out of the screen in devil gear or whatever. And uh, he got a job, and money takes people away from other people. You know, money is um, that's what it's all about. It's money. It's a job, and if you get paid a better fee, then uh, see ya. No matter how much you love the music or pretend to. <laughs> If there's something better comes along and uh, it makes life easier for you, that's what will happen. And that's what that's exactly what happened. He was offered a really, really good yeah. job. So so in 86, Alcatraz decided to move ahead with a very different but still very talented guitarist uh, in Danny Johnson. More blues oriented, less of like a domineering presence. Is this a de- deliberate move on your part to shift the band away from guitar a little bit? Yeah, well, I, I thought, again, Danny was very much, a, you know, a band member. He was somebody who was used to being in a band like he was play, he played for Rod Stewart, etc., etc. He played a bunch of different people. And he was never one of these guys would stand out in front and start posing and doing all those silly leg kicks and stuff like that. He was a much cooler guy than that. And uh, he was definitely someone who I, I enjoyed writing songs with too. He um, was, you know, very accommodating as far as vocal lines come and, you know, that, that kind of thing. He wasn't like, oh, wiggly, wiggly over all this. He, he kept things very simple, but he was very, very tasteful and very soul, soulful in his playing. And um, But the, the unfortunate thing was about that album uh, Capitol Records wanted us to do cover versions, which is like no fucking way. I, I didn't want to do that. And so it was a miserable time. And um, we were under new management. In fact, it was um, Wendy Dio that uh, was managing the band at the time. She says, well, you've got to have a hit. You've got to have songs that make sense to people, not hidden meanings. You know, you've got to have something like Sex and Drugs and Rock and Roll. You know, and you know what I mean. Just very, very obvious, corny lyrics, you know. And that wasn't my thing either. And it's like, or, or any of us, we didn't want to get into that again because it was like taking a step backwards. You know, we didn't want to be Kiss. We didn't want to be, um, you know, whomever, you know, Metallica or whatever. Anyway, it um, was something that died a natural death because the misery in the studio was unbearable. And we did It's My Life and, you know, all that kind of thing. It was just terrible. And the record company eventually just said, Okay, well, we don't like this album, and but this is where the Tina Turner thing came in. Every, every time we walked into the Capitol building, all you could see was Tina Turner here, Tina Turner there, huge pictures on the wall of her, um, you know, her comeback, so to speak. And they were, they didn't want to accommodate a band like us anymore because they thought we'd dried up and had it, which is not the truth. We actually had a lot more in us, but they wouldn't let us play what we wanted to do. 
They just wanted yeah. to make covers to get radio play, radio friendly stuff that everyone could understand and no one had to really listen to. You know. Yeah, there, there's something like three different cover songs on that album, correct? Yeah. yeah. There, I mean, I believe it even opens up with a cover song, actually. Yeah, um, possibly. Uh, I never listened to it, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't know. <laughs> yeah, I personally love Dangerous Games, albeit sort of on its own terms. Uh, yeah. it's, it's just so unrepentantly 80s, I can't help but love it. Yeah. Uh, but how how does it stack up in your estimation in retrospect? Uh, it, to me, it was like... <laughs> Because of the time, what the time it happened, it just brings back unhappy memories. And to me, that is not one of the best performances from any of us. But there are there's probably about four or five songs on there that are pretty good. And if there was a bit more enthusiasm behind the playing, <laughs> because it was like, oh, are we done yet? You know, every, every day was like, oh, oh, I've had enough. Do you want to have a go? It's your turn. Do you want to play some guitar now? Yeah, okay. Uh, it was a bit like that. But uh, there are some pretty good songs on there. But uh, not many, I don't think. And it had nothing to do with Alcatraz. It was just, it, we could have called the band a different name. It just died. It just naturally died. And it was a very, very sad time. Yeah. So when Danny Johnson leaves, it's at this point after only like three years as an active band, Alcatraz decide to call it a day. Um, I commented in my Mythos episode that that seemed a little bit premature. Well, again, it's money. <laughs> Something came his way. Uh, Eddie Van Halen got his good friends with Eddie Van Halen and something came his way that was a little very juicy and nice and tasty. Uh, a lot of money was offered and so he left the band. He went, went, he went off with his um, brother-in-law. Eddie Van Halen wanted to do this project with a girl singer who Eddie was probably having sex with at the time. I don't know. But uh, they went along to his house over and over again and they started to do this album. They were given money to live on. Um, everything was going good. And then I think Eddie split up with this girl and their band went down the shitter. Uh, as the same happened with us. We're, I was left with a garage full of um, amplifiers and stuff that I eventually sold and the band fell apart. We all went our separate ways. And uh, it ended up with just me, being me and Jan Uvina, the drummer, looking at each other and wondering what the hell we're going to do. And so we, it just fizzled out. It was gone. The band was gone. There was no money, and I left the country. <laughs> yeah, I, around that time. Um, looking back, do you wish you guys would have stuck it out? Because I mean, pop metal still had a few good years left there. That was only '86, oh. I believe. Yeah, well, of course. But um, you know, it, that's the way it was. It just died, and and you can't you can't compete with Eddie Van Halen at that time. You know, he's a, a huge star at that time. And if you'd asked me to sing doo-wops, you know, backing up vocals for whomever, I would have done it. If you'd paid me the right money. I saw it coming. You know, that, that last album was, a, you know, the last hurrah for me and for all of us. And it felt like it. After Alcatraz, you reconnect with a uh, former guitarist who would audition for you, Chris Impelitary, and you release the excellent Stand in Line album. Um, ha have to ask, why do you wind up joining his solo project instead of just recruiting him for Alcatraz? <laughs> I, I don't know. I, he was one of those guitar players I never saw at audition. You know, he's one of those guys that was, came to audition when I wasn't there. You know, oh, interesting. I, I, I knew nothing about him. And he just called me up. He'd heard that the band was gone. And he just called me up and he said he was making an album. And would I like to uh, write the songs with him? And I said, well, send me a tape and I'll see what I can do. You know, that's how that started. Just as simple as that. Um, so you guys tour the the album actually was voted one of the better albums of of 88 on MTV I believe uh, it was it was actually relatively successful what ultimately leads to your departure from Impelitary. <laughs> uh, well, we, we did a, a few shows not very many three or four i think it yeah. was and uh it, again it was a lack of money so um i was living in an apartment in hollywood and chris was playing paying the rent for me I had no telephone no tv uh, a pull out uh, couch that turned into a bed and it was a very very miserable time and uh, at that point my family was in australia because i came back uh, to Los Angeles to actually rehearse and play with this band or and record whatever and it became too tiresome to be um, totally jet lagged every moment of my life you know traveling from Australia to here was killer and so in the end I just said I can't do this anymore yeah 
and that's what happened. Um, so at what point do you hook back up with Cozy Powell for this force field project? Uh, that, again, was that was a uh, phone call from a guy called Ray Fennick, who was with the Spencer Davis group. And uh, he called me up, asked what I was doing. I said, well, nothing right now, very much. And uh, Cozy had done a few sessions with him before with this uh, studio uh, band called Force Field. And that's what it was. He said, well, it's basically kind of covers or new songs written by people who are kind of well known. And um, I said, yeah, well, how much? And that was it. It was basically a studio band. It was never going to be anything that was going to go on the road. But uh, I did a couple of albums with them. Uh, I liked the first one, but the, the follow-up ones, uh, one, I think I did another one, uh, wasn't very much. I didn't think much of that at all. But the, the first one was okay. With, um, yeah, very poppy for the early 90s. Yeah, but but that's that's what I'm saying. It was covers and completely different music, which I didn't mind. It was nice to get away from doing the usual thing and worrying, you know, are we making the right record here for the public who love us so much or whatever. But but this was totally for anybody. It was pop music, and it didn't matter because it was a studio band. We were never going to tour. So it's around this time in the early 90s uh, that it's been rumored for years you hooked up with a German stage production of Wind in the Willows mm. uh, and with a couple of Deep Purple guys, John Lord and Don Airy. Mm. Uh, I, I know very briefly in the 70s your record companies had suggested the possibility of acting for you, right? Uh, is this essentially kind of an extension of that? No, yeah, but, I mean, that was totally just a musical. Um we all had characters. I was the badger and um, everybody else was some kind of woodland animal. But um, it was just a, a stage show with a, a narrator and he told the story. And then after the story was told, um, th there would be a song from whomever, you know, uh, whichever character it was in the play, so to speak. But it was never really acting at all. But there was a time way back when uh, I thought about acting it was always something that interested me because it's uh, sort of music and acting go together in a way sort of ish because you're pl pretending to be somebody on stage that you're not anyway you're always playing a character uh, that's not the real me that goes out on stage that's some other guy but it was something I'm always interested in i know there's a couple of film cameos uh, of you up on youtube i believe you were you had a few yeah cameos here and there in the 70s yeah that was the worst movie ever but uh, that was uh, done by djm um in in london uh, dick james music and he put every uh sort of uh, well-known comedy actor into that uh movie or straight you know regular kind of actor and musician and, and he thought if all those people were shoved into one movie that would make a successful film but of course it doesn't work that way it was just a damn mess and a very very bad movie but it was fun to make i loved it because it was just silly but it was uh, to be on camera and and well i didn't say very much in the movie like what or who or something they changed their image see cook was dressed up like tarzan and we were sort of apes you know me tarzan yeah and you were singing while you were swinging on a rope. But it, it was just fun to make uh, this movie with some of my friends. A lot of my friends were in that movie, and it was, it was just cool to do. And I, I had scripts sent to me after that was done, amazingly enough, because I did nothing in it. I didn't act as such, you know. Hey, it works for Scarlett Johansson. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> As the 90s uh, sort of dawned, uh, so too did a new musical project for you. You hooked back up with your buddy from Alcatraz, Jimmy Waldo, and uh, Frank, Frankie Benali from Quiet Riot, and Bruce Kulick from the no-makeup version of Kiss uh, for one of my very favorite of your musical projects named Blackthorn. So uh, how did... Oh, no, that, that was Bob Kulick. Uh, Bob Kulick, sorry, not Bruce Kulick. Yeah. But uh, uh, Bob Kulick did write a lot of the music for uh, No Makeup Kiss is what I was referring to. But yeah... Um, yeah, yeah, How yeah. Did this come about? I wish it had been Bruce Kulick, to be honest. But anyway, <laughs> that's another thing. Yeah, but Bruce and I are very good friends. Uh, Bob and I were never very good friends but because of uh, you know different tastes in the way uh, the music should be played, sung, whatever. But uh, it it did pretty well, you know. But it was it, it, we went to Japan. We did an acoustic show in Japan, playing heavy music, so to speak, which is very weird. But it was I was surprised by actually the response of the audience to an acoustic version of um, whatever we were playing at the time. Yeah, but th this heavily, the afterlife or whatever track, you're like, yeah. It, w it was really, really pretty good. But um, it was a bit of a clash of the uh, 
personalities there. It just didn't work. Um, as good as the musicianship may have been, I was away from home. I was on the road for, for eight months away from my family, and I couldn't take it anymore. So I split from that band because it was just too much. Eight months away from home was, you know, a year from home. And I had two kids who were growing up, and they missed their daddy, and I missed them. And they were still in Australia at this time. So I split from that band, and they called me up, and I said, I just can't do it anymore. I want to do something else. Now, you employed a very different vocal style on Afterlife, sort of like a guttural, like aggressive, almost like a sand <laughs> sandpaper vocal. Were you inspired by anything specific to sort of make that? A I wasn't inspired. This was Bob Kulik's idea. He said, sing more like the guy from ACDC. And I said, what are you talking about? He said, you know, more like, like this. And I said, look, if you wanted the guy from ACDC, get him in this freaking band, not me. I said, I sing like Graham. But what I did to keep the calm, I, I put on this stupid voice, which I, I can't stand that album myself. I put on this stupid voice, which wasn't me. Parts of it were, yes. There, there is a bit of me coming in there. But he wanted me to do this stupid, stupid voice. And no way would I do that. That was another thing that just said to me, no, you don't belong here. And when I got... Well, actually, I got so stressed out, I had a seizure in, in the recording studio. I fell down in front of the microphone because the stress and the, um, the unhappiness got to me. It was just the worst time ever because, as I said, I was away from my family apart from anything else. And it was just too much. Which, which actually brings me to something that I've rarely heard you talk about in interviews. You have throughout your life, uh, if, if if this is too personal, do please please do tell me. Well, but um, you have struggled with epilepsy throughout your career, correct? Yeah, that that was it. Yeah, I had an epileptic seizure, and I just fell down, and um, I had to take some time off because it was getting to me. And um, it's something I take. I have to take drugs every damn day because at one point I stopped taking them a few years ago and uh, it happened to me on a plane. I had a seizure. It's very embarrassing apart from anything else. But um, that's, that band did that to me. And um, the unhappy environment was just way too much for my little brain to calculate. It was just too damn much. And it was an unhappy time. Our early 90s are a really a, a huge paradigm shift in the industry, obviously, with the influx of grunge and so forth. From your perspective, how did that affect the entire sort of industry at that point for you? Well, it, um, that was it. That was another reason why the band disbanded, because you cannot compete with your Nirvanas, etc., whoever was around at that time. It was, the times were changing, as Bob Dylan said. I mean, it really was. And it was time for something different. And uh, um, this band could not go that way. I mean, I wanted yeah. to change. I would, I would have done that stuff. I would have changed the whole damn concept of that uh, Blackthorn album if I had the wherewithal to do it. But we had to be this so-called heavy rock band, and so we were stuck in that damn drawer of being just one, you know, one sort of dimensional musical damn pathway. That to, to me. It's not, it's not me. I have so many different kinds of music inside me, and we all do. But Bob Kulik, again, sing like Popeye, you know, do all that. And <laughs> OK, let me do that so I can go home. That was my that was my that's the way I felt at the time. Let me get the damn hell out of this freaking band. Otherwise, my fucking brain's going to blow up, which it did in front of the microphone, as I told you. But I'm, when that. That movement came along. It was like the Liverpool movement when the Beatles happened. You know, you had to be from Liverpool at that time. And at this point, you had to be from Seattle. You know what I mean? Everything changed because it was getting old hat, all this heavy rock stuff. To me, it was. And, um, you know, things have turned around again. It's gone full circle, I know. Yeah. So so after Blackthorn, you kind of take a break for a while in the mid-90s. And then you wind up reuniting with your former Alcatraz uh, guitarist Danny Johnson in the latter half of the decade with your fifth solo record, Underground. Yeah. How did you and Danny wind up getting back together? Well, because we'd always been in touch. We'd always been good friends, and uh, he was living nearby, and um, he said, hey, Graham, what about doing an album? Blah, blah, blah. And uh, Kevin Valentine, the, the drummer, was friends with him, and he was going to engineer, I believe, at the time, as well as playing drums, uh, the album. And we, we put this together at, um, at uh, Danny's house, and it was it was a breath of fresh air because it was I was actually working with people who were pleasant and uh, I enjoyed that 
And so, again, that wasn't all heavy, what, you know, balls to the wall bullshit. It was um, a little mixture of everything, I think, that album. You know. Yeah, very very different style for you. Um, you know, you were incorporating little elements of you know folk here and there, a little bit of yeah. grun a uh, grungier kind of a sound, just very different yeah. uh, sound for you. Yeah, um, a bit of everything. Um, which is what I it's what I like doing. You know, that, that's uh, part of being a musician is to be inventive or at least take a risk once in a while. But yeah. um, it, it doesn't always work. You know. Yeah. Well, well, it's a great record. Um, in in a discussion in a discussion I had. With uh, Gary Shea, he mentioned offhandedly, and I was surprised to learn this, that in the late 90s, you guys were sort of a hair's breadth away from reuniting as Alcatraz mm. with Ingve. Somewhere in the 90s, mid-90s, we actually got on a phone, and we were going to do another record with Ingve. No one knows this part of the story. We were, all of us, going to go to Ingve's house in Florida and do an Alcatraz record. The original band, Jane Yavina on drums, Ingve, me and Jimmy and Graham. And we were talking back and forth. And at the last minute, this other rocket scientist manager that Ingve had said he wants all the money to go to Ingve. And we said, that's not going to happen. How, how close was that to actually going down? I know nothing of this. This is news to me. Really? Yeah, he had mentioned that there were some sort of negotiations and they wound up breaking down when his manager asked for all of the money, essentially. Oh, I I don't know anything about that. I really don't. I I mean, I might have heard rumors about it, but I don't really know the whole story because it never happened. I never spoke to the guys from Alcatraz at all, Uh, Gary especially. Interesting. Um, Uh, Yeah, I mean, that's just one of those things that's probably a folktale or something. I don't know. Okay. Now, um, here is a question that myself and I'm sure many members of my audience would like to hear an answer to. So I have to ask, one of my favorite bands on this planet is a legendary Japanese metal band by the name of Anthem. Mm. Uh, Over here, fairly obscure, but in Japan, you know, they are like Judas Priest. They are huge. And in 99, you briefly joined them for the album Heavy Metal Anthem. How did this partnership come about exactly? Do you believe a phone call? (laughs) But it went, hello, hello, Graham son, Graham son, sorry. It was, uh, yeah, a different accent, but the same kind of phone call. How would you feel about doing this album, which is actually a Japanese album, but we have to translate it into English? And how would you feel about doing this album? And I thought, bloody hell, this is heavy duty stuff. Yeah. And um, I said, yes, and how much? <laughs> and uh, when I found out how much they were going to pay me, I said, absolutely, bloody lutely. And so I did. And so I had to translate all this um uh, these strange uh, Japanese uh, verses into real English had to juggle the words around because none, none of the, the translations worked. Yeah, I've often wondered this because I speak Japanese. I know the original lyrics yeah. and how they kind of translate. And it's not a direct translation. No. You, take some, you take a little bit of liberty with it. Were you just handed sort of a rough English translation and then you went off and running with that? Yeah, I had to put, put the words in order. Interesting. Uh, the, the, and the ands and the thens and the... You you know, it, it was juggling, but uh, the the album I liked the music very much. I thought it was really cool, and I, I loved the way they play. And um, that was that was just a, a so called project, yeah. As such, well, that's that's actually what I was gonna uh, ask you about. You actually wound up doing a tour with Anthem in Japan. Yeah. So I've often yeah. wondered, was that originally planned to be permanent, or was it always understood that you were just keeping the seat warm until Ezo Sakamoto came back to the band? And, and... yeah, it was just a, a one off thing, you know. So we toured. It was a tour for the album to you know promote the album. Basically, that was it. And I wasn't ever going to be in their band. Oh, okay. It was uh, just uh, a one-off. So, uh, speaking of which, after Anthem, you rejoin forces with Chris and Pelletary for a kind of a borderline thrash metal record, probably the heaviest record of your career, System X. Um, definitely a, a more on the aggressive end of your career output. How did it come to pass that you wind up hooking back up with Chris? Well, he, he got in touch with me. <laughs> I, mean, I, I didn't think he would, actually, because after the first album, I thought he... Uh, you know, uh, recruited his old singer again. I thought they were back on the road doing whatever they were doing. But he sort of came out of the blue and he just asked, how are you doing? I said, oh, I'm doing fine, blah, blah, blah. And um, I said, what are you doing? He said, well, I'm, I'm creating a new album. I've got this, these ideas. 
would you like to listen to them? So I said, yeah, okay. And so that was it. He sent me a, a tape, as we used to have back then, the olden days. And um, the, I played. I said, yeah, this is pretty cool. It's, and I said, what, what are you going to do with it? Um, I said, well, would you like to, you know, write a couple of these songs? And so I started, I, I wrote, I don't know, three or something. And he said, would you like to write a few more? Yeah, okay. And then eventually he came to my house and we recorded at home and uh, we did the vocals at home. He did all his tracks at home at his house. And that's it. we put the album together and it was it was pretty heavy, what I remember of it anyway. Uh, it, it took a while to um, to record, I seem to think, because both of us are doing different things. How did that come to an end? Was that always intended to be a uh, one-off? Yeah, yeah. It was never meant to be a tour or anything. It was just a, an album. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, it turned out pretty good. Yeah. Uh, so, and, and then you, you're basically your band's a uh, touring concern throughout the remainder of sort of the 2000s, and then in 2008, you sort of reform Alcatraz, which mm. led to a major media shit stink, if you'll pardon the nomenclature. There was a lot of yeah, yeah. there's a lot of he said, she said, and the long and short of yeah. it, it ended with you sort of using the Alcatraz name for what had been up until that point your solo band. Yeah, and then there was sort of a separate band. It's kind of like what happened to Saxon or whatever. There's sort of two lineups of the same band, uh, and that was how it was portrayed in the media. Do you feel that depiction was at all accurate? Yeah, that's about right. I, I heard that I was going out as the Graham Bonnet band or whatever, and um, yeah. it. it um, I heard that the other guys were playing out as Alcatraz. You know, Jimmy and uh, Gary Shea and. Whomever, I think probably Jam was in the band, Yuvina, I'm not sure. But they were out there doing their thing with a different guitar player. I'm not sure who he was. I don't really know much about the lineup. But um, it, I thought, well, hell, how come they're going out there playing the songs I wrote with Ingve and Steve? I, I thought, well, okay, if they can do it, so can I. So I decided to change the name but because I thought, well, maybe we'll get a bit more work. And it worked. We did get more work, and we played quite a lot with uh, Howie Simon and uh, Tim Luce and... Uh, at that time, it was uh, Kevin Ballantyne playing drums for us, and it worked very well. But um, then I had a call from Gary, and that was uh, like, you can't use the name, you can't use the name, blah, blah, blah. What, why? They're my songs. But, you know, they were using the name, why shouldn't I? And anyway, it ended up me saying, okay, uh, I'm not going to do anything about it, Gary. I'm going to keep the name, and that's it. And so I think they stopped playing as Alcatraz. I'm not sure. Yeah, I've, I haven't heard anything uh, from them. Was the, I, I don't know. Was there ever any talk of the original lineup reuniting at any point, like with a different guitarist no. or otherwise? No, never. Okay. So no. it, now it's around this time also that you begin dropping hints of a new Alcatraz album. Um, and I believe this uh, the song My Kingdom Come was being name dropped as a potential first single. But not mm. only does that album never materialize, that song just recently appeared on your new Graham Bonnet Band EP. Yes, it did. Which is excellent, by the way. Um, I thank you. Yes. Does this mean that your Alcatraz plans are basically scrapped for the time being, or what? Oh, totally. Because this is a new band now, and uh, we we just got back from Japan. We've been to Europe, you know, England, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Everything's going really well for the new band, and it's uh, new players with younger people. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it's a different lineup. It has a different look. It's not that heavy. Well, there's some heavy stuff in it. Yeah. But um, the Kingdom contract was put aside for about five years. Russ wrote it sort of over the phone with me. Uh, we decided how the song should go. I wanted sort of a queen kind of uh, a bit of everything in there, just different sections, not all one, you know, uh, time signature and stuff like that, to be a little bit more in inventive than since you've been gone, let's say. And uh, so we put that together on the phone, and then I just, I left it aside because um, the guys in the band didn't like it. They thought it was too 1980s or whatever. It was too much like Queen. How are we going to play that live without, because there's a lot of overlapping vocals. So I saw we use pre-recorded vocals and sing over the top of them, you know, like everybody else does, you know. But um, nobody wanted to work with it. So th that's why it was never recorded uh, by the the latter part of the last Alcatraz. As far as the Graham Bonnet band, are there any plans after this EP to be doing a full length? Yeah, that's what we're doing right now. We're working on stuff as we speak and uh, that's what i'm doing today tomorrow the next day we have a hell of a lot of work to do uh we're playing at the whiskey on what day is it on Saturday? 22nd. on the 22nd which is kind of like a just like a warm-up thingy it's nothing special but uh we've been as i said we just got back from japan with the tour and it went very very well we played over there with uh, uh michael shanker band 
and uh, we had a great time. Yes. It was fantastic, man. I was just about to mention that you recently reunited on stage with Michael Shanker. Yeah. Um, and it sounded incredible, by the way. Oh, thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> Was that that had to be a surreal experience it was <laughs> it was and uh, there were knowing smiles cast between the two of us because we all know what happened on that very fateful night <laughs> and uh, so uh, you know it was like we've actually got to do this haven't we <laughs> and it kept clothing on for a change you know uh, which was uh, it was funny and it was just uh, it, it was a blast man it really was and to see to, to you know to smile back at each other after that horrible time we had it was uh, it was magical it really was so i i put this question to gary shea and he politely said never say never so i'll put it to you now do you think it's ever possible that we could see a full-blown reunion with ingve vi or danny johnson or anybody of the classic alcatraz lineup no do you- i don't see that ever ever happening really i mean we may work with each other you know like uh, i might do something with steve vi or i might do something with uh, Ingve, maybe, or you know, or Danny, uh, but the the whole band, no, nah. I, I I could never see that happening. But you don't know, you never know. There might be such a demand, <laughs> maybe. Yeah. And uh, if the money was right, we'd be there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, well, Graham, that pretty much does it for this interview. I can't. Alrighty, bro. I cannot thank you enough uh, for doing. You're this. very welcome. <laughs> I hope I didn't drift towards towards the end. It's bloody hot as hell in here. Really? Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm. It's, it's I'm a very in, warm day here. And where are you? I'm, where are you? I'm in Phoenix, so you don't get to complain. <laughs> yeah, all right then. Okay, shut the hell up. <laughs> yeah, it's warm in here today. It's very humid. I'm sweating like a bloody pig here. Yeah, it's not.